This week on The Gentleman's Romantic Book Nook, we've read the first eight chapters of Bear by Marion Engel. Here's the story so far. Lou, a 27-year-old librarian, is whisked away to the Ontario wilderness to document the estate of Colonel Jocelyn Carey. There, she uncovers the Colonel's most romantic and endearing secret, a live, actual bear. Tempted by the bear's company and intrigued by his genteel nature, she invites him into her life, into her home, and perhaps into her heart. Welcome back to the Gentleman's Romantic Book Nook, a romance review podcast. I am Mac Bonnie. Hi, and I'm Lucky again, as always. We are here with our second episode where we're actually diving into some of the content, the first eight chapters of Bear, the most controversial novel ever written in Canada. Yeah, indeed, and it's quickly becoming the most controversial novel I've ever written, written, read. C- certainly <laughs> top three most controversial books we've ever read. Definitely show. cresting the three. <laughs> yeah, it's um, I you know it's uh, it was quite a journey, and I read quite a bit about it. I have a, a lot of notes about it. I have a lot of opinions. Uh, I'd like same. to hear, I'd like to hear some of your thoughts first, though. It's a slow burn, but <laughs> once the shit starts, the mm. shit starts, and uh, <laughs> I picked my words very carefully in those sentences. Mm. I I find I found myself in the first two chapters specifically just. Uh, kind of connecting with the character. You're like, wow, this is a woman really finding her independence yes. and like rediscovering herself. And I was really enjoying kind of this discovery of her. And then chapter three happened and my notes go from this like, oh, she's she's fi- she's in herself. She's finding out what it means to be a woman again and independent to, uh, wait a minute, what did she say at that part? And the rest of my <laughs> notes are just, wait, um, hang on. Yeah, because her journey starts off kind of beautiful. Uh, she's like, I have a quote here that I wrote down. I have an odd sense, she wrote on a postcard to the director, of being reborn. And it's like this actual, I, I did connect with the character. Lou is the name of the mousy librarian who's um, found herself at Colonel Carey's estate trying to like, and she's like documenting all of his materials for like a historical society or some kind of like institute. And the journey, yeah, she's like shedding off her old self. Uh, but there is there is some foreshadowing of what's to come, even on page two. At one point it says, she loved shabby old things as a descriptor for Lou, and that is some of the best foreshadowing I think I've ever seen. One of the first things I really marked down uh, off of your point of this foreshadowing was the this idea of zoomorphism, which I saw consistently throughout the very beginning of the book. On the first page, there's this whole section where they're talking about her, like, she lived like a mole, scurrying hastily <laughs> through the tube in the winter. I'm like, ooh, yowza. And, um, through, <laughs> I will be talking about my color scheming code for this book. I, I picked five different colors to mark different passages I needed to bring up. Um, this one marked my first one of big red flags. Um, <laughs> when I started getting nervous very quickly, a big red flag mark. And there is, there's quite a bit of those, for, I think, in this first eight chapters. For that mole line, I have a note written. A great alternate title would be The Mole and the Bear. <laughs> <laughs> I understand this whole idea of minimalism and just the one word title, but yeah, that would have been, that would have fit right in with, I think they were going for. <laughs> uh, there are some weird, the the way it's written is really beautiful with some of the descriptions of nature. It like kind of makes you feel like you actually want to, I, I could see the house that she goes to very clearly, the nature around it. But the way she describes some of the characters is a little weird. Uh, she meets up with the like caretaker, or, like the dude who's going to show her around. Um, whose name is Homer, weirdly. And he has a son named Sim or Syme. And Syme is like super pale and she describes him as middle-aged and cheerful. His son Sim was pale-eyed, pale-haired, a ghost, an albino. And it's just like, do you really need to do... It's like she couldn't decide which like words she wanted to use to describe him. It just kind of builds <laughs> pale-haired, pale-eyed, a ghost, an albino, a freak, a loser. She gets really aggressive with each, with each of the characters that she I- introduces, I find. She'd get that to Homer a little bit, too. Like, she kind of blasted him for being pig-faced or something. I forget <laughs> specifically the line, but I wrote that down multiple times. Like, she's aggressive to these new people she's meeting. And she's... I understand what she's alone. Like, not a particularly great person. 
There's a line she writes down where it's like, um, she never really liked animals. She didn't really mourn her puppy when she died, and she always hated kittens. And it's like, wow, what kind of piece of shit are you? Like, pump the brakes book. We need to, like, somewhat identify with this librarian character. I think there was a serious turning point for me when we hit chapter three. That when we start yes. finding out about this bear, I found that reveal to be kind of hilarious and out of left field because the the book takes a lot of time talking about like history and the things that um, Lou is interested in and Homer's long winded descriptions about homes and whatnot. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he's like, Oops, uh, forgot to mention something. And he puts his finger and his little dimple in his face, like the bear. Forgot <laughs> to mention one little thing. It's a bear. <laughs> It's a bear it's a living bear. in the backyard. Treat it, treat it like a dog. You'll be cool. See ya. And he gets in his yeah, boat and, and sails that's away. Kind of, that's kind of it. Yeah, he dips and comes back the next day to check if she's fine. I think that maybe that warranted a little bit more attention right off the bat. How many historians do you think have died, have been eaten by this bear that he's just like lured up to this house? That's <laughs> – she hasn't found any bones yet, but we're not – that far into the book. And she is not phased by this reveal. He has a very long monologue where he talks about the history of the bear and how it got brought there. And she doesn't say, I think the entirety of chapter three is the monologue of, of uh, Homer telling Lou about the bear. And she doesn't have like a whole line in the entire chapter. It's a short chapter. It's like two pages, but she doesn't say a fucking thing. He's going on and on about this bear. And I bet she thinks that he's nuts. Just like, oh, uh-huh. A bear. Right. She talks almost immediately about being excited about this reveal as if this is like, this is the juice I needed in my life. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't connect. And I think that's maybe a good thing considering like what's going to happen in this book. I guess I'm glad I'm not really relating to this person. I do have a theory that she was attracted to bears before the book. That This is not like a new awakening for her necessarily. Because they have that line in the beginning where she says um, she has a love for musty things. Oh, no. Uh, she she loved shabby old things. Um, we, they paint her as this um, mole character. And then, uh, yeah, at the beginning of chapter four, I, I, I highlighted the line. And the idea of a bear struck her as joyfully Elizabethan and exotic, which is not the reaction most people would have to being like stuck with a bear. Yeah, I think that reaction, too, is almost misleading because in that sense, I think about, like, a bear on a circus ball. Like, that's the kind of excitement I would get out of it, not so much that, like, I'm just kicking it with a bear. And I think that her excitement in that moment was definitely an uh-oh moment, which is another one of my color schemes. <laughs> uh-oh. I like how you uh -oh. red flags, uh-ohs. I give that two red flags in one. Uh-oh. There, I realize at the end they're very similar. All of my, all of my color scheme tabs. Your system, <laughs> by the way, Lucky, seems better than mine. I just have like an insane amount of like notes and underlines and scribbles in my book. If, if I ever like die and this is sold to like a Goodwill, somebody will find it and it'll be like a House of Leaves esque journey of them through the text. Wow, could you imagine being a closet pervert and you finally got your hands on your first inner species sex book and a man's mad scribbling is filled with the pages? <laughs> that would be, I mean, it would maybe they would like bond with my spirit and my notes. They would like love, they would love it. Hey man, that's fine. I mean, all the power to them, I guess, to find satisfaction in your words I, oh, That's later. an interesting notion that you have there, Lucky. What if somebody who found the book who didn't know that they were into inner species love and this was like their uh-oh moment? They get to the end of chapter three and they're like, uh-oh. I think that was the fear for sure, just picking up the book in general. Um, and I know that just like to all of you listeners out there, if you find something new about yourself while reading this, grbooknook at gmail.com. We want to hear your stories. We want to hear. We want your questions. We want your stories. We want we, your We're here for you. We want to grow with you. Open ears so and open know. hearts. Let us know what you truly think. Thank you. Yeah. This is a safe space. Um, I, we're not here to make fun of you. No, definitely not. But I think we were all nervous about what was going to happen to us right when chapter three turned. Uh, I please, I would please, I want to, I want to hear your thoughts. I've got so many. I need to. That's fine because the thing I think I want to talk about is in chapter seven, where um, <laughs> uh, Lucy Leroy appears. Oh. Lucy Leroy, the old Indian woman, yeah. who then recommends, "Hey, maybe take a shit next to the bear." Um. Which is not advice you should take. 
uh, ever. Let's <laughs> let's let me find that exact <laughs> line because it is it is worth quoting. <clears throat> okay, yeah, Lucy Leroy on page thirty six of my volume. Lucy's face crinkled with some inconceivable merriment. She did not look one hundred years old, only eternal. Shit with the bear, she said. He like you then. Morning you shit. He shit. Bear live by smell. He like you. I don't think she's Russian, but that's how I like to read that. Yeah, you you jumped around there too. I was thinking like Ukrainian, then Russian. You were kind of like, yeah, interesting. I hope that if they ever make a movie out of Bear, they include that line in it. Like, she was a mousy librarian until she met the bear. And then she was the bear roaring. And then the old lady, she with the bear. He liked you then. A budding love. <laughs> I would like to mention, though, that this bear is not a roaring bear. Really this not. is a very tepid bear. Yeah, the bear is actually shockingly tame. You, It is a bit like a lumbering old gentle man that you could really tenderly mm. embrace. Mm. Exactly like <laughs> a sort of dim-witted but hunky neighbor that you want to spend all your time with. I didn't get the sense that Lou was feeling anything for this bear until we get into chapter eight, really. It's the whole time they, they really personify I it. I think she's loving bears. I think she's into it. She describes the bear as indubitably male and then she sees it all like gross and covered in, in crap. And she still is just like, ah, who and what are you? Silly old bear. That was weird. Yeah. I see this as kind of like red herring moments that my brain is like, no, that's not. She's not going to do it. It's fine. That was just a weird thing a person did. <laughs> and then the rest of the chapter is her like feeding it. And it's like, you know. At a certain point, you need to accept what kind of book this is. And that point is chapter eight. Yeah. I think chapter eight was the real the real rough moment there. Because <laughs> like you said, Lucy Leroy gives her the advice to shit next to the bear to get it to trust her. And she like immediately does it. She like runs into the house and starts eating a burrito as soon as she hears that she needs to crap next to this bear to get it to love her. Yeah, it's that's that same day, right? I don't remember. I don't remember if in the chapter it's the next morning. It's, but I believe yeah. it's very, very Less close. Less than 12 time. hours pass, I think, between she gets the advice. I think it's probably her next bowel movement. If it wasn't her next bowel movement, that's even weirder. Because then she's like thinking about it and she's like, mm, that this poop's going to be fine, but not really a bear shit. Like I need to take something that's going to, I need to take a dump that's going to like endear myself in this creature's heart. That's funny. You'd have to think about that, right? You'd need to be like, okay, what's going to be a shit that this bear really respects and latches onto almost? If this book were made today, she would be looking at like Charmin Ultra commercials on her phone with the animated bears and the toilet paper. She would be like, hmm. So she'd take her big, she'd take her big dump and the bear would poke its head out and she looks it dead in the eyes and she only takes one toilet paper square and she does the whole cleaning and the bear's very impressed. Oh, shit. If we get to the end of the book and it's like brought to you by Shaman, I'm going to lose my shit. That actually would And be I, would I lose my shit? I'll only need one fucking square. <laughs> this podcast brought to you in part by Shaman Ultra. Yeah, I mean, that obviously wasn't the most shocking part about Chapter 8, but I do think it was important that we spent a little bit of time talking about the shits. And this, I think, is the first time she meets Lucy. Lucy recommends this to her. Like, what a way to start off your conversation. Like, hi, I'm Lou. I work for this. We go to poop with the bear. She also doesn't really talk to her much. It's pretty, like, right off the bat, like, bear like you, poop next to it. Like, <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Have a good night. <laughs> yeah, okay, bye. My, my son is here. I'm, I'm still waiting for the moment that bear does speak they, they keep personifying it and i think that for me would just be the nice moment you know um are we getting further into chapter eight where the bear breaks into the home where the yeah the bear breaks into her house and her reaction is to like go and sit on her desk yeah is work more and be calm about it <laughs> she heard him slaking his thirst at the enamel water pail in the house she and this is another quote from chapter eight she went to the top of the stairs. She saw him below in the darkness, staring up at her. Go back to bed, she told him. This isn't your, like, you know, sister's kid that's staying at your house overnight. Yeah, go back to bed. And then his thick legs pumped up the stairs towards her. This is a nightmare that I have had. She retreated to her desk and sat on it, hunching towards the window. So she is, like, kind of trying to get away, but really, like, there's no fear in her mind. And then uh, there's this utterly horrifying, well, I don't know about horror. It depends, because I think there's a lot of things in the book that if you were to, like, totally put your mind into the character and what this author's trying to do, it's, like, tender, 
But then if you like look at the book from a third person perspective, like if you were literally were like walking by her house and looked in the window on some of this stuff, you would be like mortified. They talk about how there's like vacationers that come and stay nearby, like in cabins and stuff. Can you imagine? It's like first thing in the morning. Ha, ah, honey, heading out to our family cabin in the woods. Oh, look, a local. Is that a bear? Uh, honey, I think it is. <laughs> oh, it looks like she's some sort of. What? Oh, oh. Oh, get the kids below deck. Honey, get the kids below deck. <laughs> it would be haunting to see, I think, this, this chicanery happening on this island. That's a real kind word for it, Lucky. I'm trying to be kind about it. It's it's hard to digest because I know now that we have this turning page where we've had a little bit of physical play with the bear, the book is only going to go downhill from here and we still have a bunch of chapters to read. The fire blazed. <laughs> the bear slept wheezily occasionally winking his fireward eye. Fireward eye is a brilliant line. I like that. I wish I'd thought of that. She grew warm, that is a good line. kicked off her shoes, and found herself running her bare foot over his thick, soft coat, exploring it with her toes, finding Ugh. it had depths and depths, layers and layers. Uh, oh, it's really gross. That's like honey falling out of my throat. Uh, she found herself running her bare foot over, so that sort of paints it like it's not really a conscious decision it's just her mm. destiny it's almost like it's animal instinct <laughs> there's so many good taglines in here for, for this book he's a wild animal after all as i have highlighted on this same page because <laughs> she ends up like inviting the bear the bear like breaks in right like she didn't close the door fully or something and the bear breaks into her house in chapter eight and she sort of half-heartedly tries to get it to leave, but then ends up cuddling with it. We assume all night, all night, I mean, they don't have sex in this chapter, thank God, because that would be moving much too fast. They still need to become friends first. And then chapter eight, she's like gotten a little, at the end of chapter eight, she like realizes she's a little drunk. The bear stood up, yawned, and lumbered out in front of her down the stairs, its hindquarters shifting awkwardly as he made the downward climb. So she's chucking out his ass as he's leaving. He went out to the back door, went out the back door without looking back, and she locked it. Pumped herself, a, pumped herself a clean pail of water. I did not know where that sentence was going at first and went to bed. So the bear leaves before it gets too late. He's a gentleman. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, shoot, that covers all eight chapters. Is there anything else you want to talk about that we forgot to mention about our thoughts, our feelings? Uh, she's talking in one chapter. Uh, yes, like, thank you for asking. She talks in one mm -hmm. chapter about how she doesn't know a lot about bears, but she took her nephews to see a movie with a bear in it, and it wasn't very good. And I was just wondering if you had any ideas what that what movie she went and saw was. The live-action version of Yogi the Bear. <laughs> and that's her. That would actually explain a lot of her actions, I think. <laughs> she, it was a really bad movie. It <laughs> explains why she would bring him a picnic basket every morning. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh. the dots start connecting. And then later when she's rubbing her bare feet in the bear's hide, like, her bare feet? feet, as it were, she oh. says, oh, Ranger's not going to like this one, Yogi. Okay, so yeah, okay, let's actually, let's try and sum up. What do you think of the book so far? Uh, so far, I think it's really interesting um, the way that Marion has uh, presented it to the audience because it does feel like it's this frail and... Uh, unempowered woman, kind of like discovering mm -hmm. this side of herself that she feels she lost for a long time, getting to go to this um, estate and kind of like rediscover herself and feel better. Um, it it almost feels like this bear connection was like not pivotal the way that it's introduced and then instantly flips. I had around. thought that maybe she had written like the start of a romance novel between like Lou and Homer at this isolated cabin and then maybe separately had a short story about a woman having sex with a bear and then was just one day her notes got all shuffled by like a breeze through her office and she picked them up and I've got it and then she just sits down at her typewriter and just you got your chocolate in my peanut pulls the paper out I like to think of it more Frankenstein than that I like I like that the the papers fly but then they're fluttering together and like somehow like goosebumps. the stapler flies also and staples a bunch of them together in a Frankensteinian manner. <laughs> and she picks it up. She's like, yes, perfect. <laughs> I like it so far. I think it's like you said, it's beautifully written story about this woman discovering herself. And then there's just this bear romance thrown in. And I think what I like most and what is like 
maybe endearing about the book in any way is that it normalizes her behavior towards the bear so much. Like you're not supposed to think it's weird. And I think that jumps back to a quote we discussed pretty in depth in episode one. And that's like the book. It's as plausible as kitchens. And it really like (laughs) makes you, that was Margaret Atwood's review that said bear is as plausible as kitchens. And like the book really tries to make you feel like this could happen which is ludicrous but when you read it you're also like i don't know i don't know where they're gonna stop i don't know i think if i went through chapters one through eight with a fine tooth comb i could remove except for chapter eight i could remove sentences or like a few pieces here or there and it'd be fine it would still just be a romance novel and i think that's what we're talking about plausible as kitchens it's very much like i totally understand this book i see like i see um lou's perspective i see her drive i get where homer's coming from I mean, I even get where the bear's coming from. It's like a loose bear in the backyard. It's an animal. And a lot of the time she's talking about it, she's talking about it as if it was just this animal that she needs to feed and take care of. But then there's like sentences in there that are like, uh, like, oh, stop having those silly thoughts, Lou. Like, whoa, wait, why did, (laughs) that's weird. Like in the middle of her doing dishes, why did she insert that? Because when you think about it, if she weren't romantically interested in the bear, I cannot believe I just, we're talking about this. Uh, <laughs> I'm hearing myself out of context. Uh, if she weren't having sex with the bear or she weren't romantically interested in the bear, we haven't gotten there yet. Haven't gotten bear yet. Then the bear would sort of function as a metaphor for like her own imprisonment, right? It's this thing that's been left to itself uh, that like hibernates through the winter, just like she did at the Institute. That's sort of chained mm. up and maybe covered in its own mistakes or poop. And then she, like, takes it down to the river and cleans it off. So if it didn't have that romantic element, and maybe it still works on some level as a metaphor for her own um, discovery of herself and her body. Oh, shit, does it? Oh, man. I don't know what wears me out more, that this is just some silly book about a woman falling in love with a bear written to, like, fund some side project. Or if it's, like, a legitimately solid metaphor for discovering your own sexuality. We're only eight chapters in, I think. She lets a bear splash around in a pool and then rubs her feet on it. I think maybe we should wait until no, maybe lucky. at least chapter 17. It's the greatest love story of our generation. Ah, uh, see, this is where I'm getting worried. You're sure you're already going down that path. <laughs> this was why I was worried you chose this if book. If you commit to the book, the book does pay off. And you don't have to, like, be in love with animals or think that that's cool to, like, enjoy the story We are so eight far. chapters in and she's going to have sexual intercourse with this bear at some point. Probably. So I'm just saying I'm going to withhold those very strong opinions until we finish this book. All right. Um, I think that's going to do it for this episode. Did you have any other hot topics? Um, yeah. Can you hit us with the, uh, the next section of chapters we're going to be reading until we reconjoin. That is going to do it for the first eight chapters of bear brings us about a third of the way through the book. Uh, for episode three, we are going to be reading chapters nine through 16 And then we'll have one more episode after that where we discuss the end of the book and um, wrap it up. Um, If you have any questions for us, any experiences, I suppose you'd like to share. Uh, If you've been reading along, we'd love to hear your thoughts on the book so far. Um, You can send those to grbooknook at gmail.com. You'll also find us on Twitter, uh, just Gentleman's Romantic Book Nook. Um, Hit us up there. You can also get on our Instagram. We're uh, at grbooknook. Um, Set that up this morning. Also... You can find us at our website, which is grbooknook.com, which will be set up here by the time this episode airs. Yes, that's right. We got the domain name. We got the domain. Yes. (laughs) We locked it down. So now it's official and we're going to have a website. So uh, look there. We're going to post. I was going to fucking say fan art. And then I just realized what that means. Maybe. Okay. Starting book two, we'll be posting fan art there. Uh, Maybe we'll start. would want us. The fan art that I want to see of this book would be for like a line of action figures that are based on the novel that never existed maybe they were like created but only like five of them left the factory if somebody wants to whip up what? a drawing of that I'd, I'd pay money i'd commission that Whew. i get i got shudders thinking about what that could possibly six be, points of articulation like, yeah see that's the shuddering bear and lou sold separately you can find us at all those places. Uh, we really want to hear from you. We're curious what you're thinking about the yeah. book, too. So get a hold of us. Yeah, if you like the show, um, tell your friends about it. Post about it. Um, hashtag Book Nook. And um, we don't advertise this in any way, as far as I know. <laughs> uh, Lucky's going to buy some billboard space up in Seattle. Yeah, but it's just going to feature me. It's very selfish. <laughs> it's it's the cover. It's the OG cover of the book, but it's the bear behind you. Uh, yeah, it's a bear nook. paw reaching over my back. Oh, you mean, oh, the OG cover. The OG okay. cover, yeah, yeah, not the new one, the one where the, you've got your bear chest, and then the bear's making it not bear. 
And maybe long That's hair fine. covering the other parts of you. I was thinking maybe I'd have things. to wear like a hat with some kind of tassels to really get the... Anyway. Chicago Bears hat. I think maybe we can pull that together in post-production with our um, creative studio. A Care Bear t-shirt. And so ends another installment of the Gentleman's Romantic Book Nook podcast. As always, I am Mac Money. And I am Lucky. Uh, we hope you will tune in again next week. Can't Same bear time. Again. Same bear <laughs> channel. <laughs> uh, I actually did like that. That was nice with the joke at the end. Happy reading. <laughs>